Okay, I'm going to introduce you to the speaker today. His name is Dan Negroni. Uh, He's the CEO of Launchbox uh, since 2013 when he started this uh, company. He has 20 plus years of experience as CEO, attorney, and senior sales and marketing executive. Through Launchbox, uh, Dan and his team provide training programs to help maximize the workforce creativity and production and bridge uh, multi generational gaps in the work in the workplace, increase employee engagement, retention, and results. Dan received his JD from a Georgetown University Law Center after completing a bachelor degree at Boston University School of Management. He was a corporate attorney at Morgan Lewis and Boston, then business attorney at Seltzer, Kaplan, McMahon, and Vitek, law firm. But for marketing, but <laughs> this sounds sounds boring. <laughs> he was also VP of Sales and Marketing and Chief Legal Counsel at Boatrax and Energine Technologies, then VP of Marketing at C Video, and after that he was General Counsel, Principal, and uh, Executive Executive VP at La Mesa RV, followed by uh, a position he had as VP of Sales and Marketing. Uh, at a company called National Health, no, pardon, sorry, uh, uh, at Tachyon Networks, and then he was CEO and President of National Health Vending Machine until 2013 when <coughs> he started launching. Um, as I said, his company assesses, consults, trains, and coach organizations of every size and industry. Uh, it's using multiple modalities such as on site training, virtual training, e learning, mobile apps, etc. etc. He was also named one of the top 100 years speakers in 2018. He's the author of Chasing Relevance, Six Steps to Understand, Engage, and Maximize the Next Generation Leaders in the Workplace. He's also an active philanthropist, and he serves as a board member of the government chair of various, of various charities, including Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America, the Farm Foundation, to name a few, and he is here in Del Mar, his nope. wife and three children. And I screwed up the Laura help. <laughs> I was trying to get my clicker to work. Oh, I got it, and the clicker works. We're all good, I think. Oh no, the clicker doesn't work. All right, raise your hand, everybody. And when I call your name, put your hand down. Let's see if I can do this. Um, Gwen, Danielle, Aiden, Cindy, Ima Imasnu, Imanchu, Alicia, Jerry, um, Nelly, AJ, Kelly, Israel, Sean, Ash, Francis, Alex. I didn't meet you when you came in, so I don't know your name. Share it. Sandra, Sandra um, Yuri, Fang, Lindsay, Sam, Krishna, Sean again, Gunn, Simin, Shannon, Sergey, uh, Catherine, John, Chasloff, Robert. Uh, Victoria, Janine, Malicia, was it? Deborah, Karen, Jared, of course, I know. Another Sean. I didn't meet you, young man. Um, Catherine again, and Dimitrov. What's your name? Josh? A nice, easy Josh. Okay, so how'd I do? Pretty good, right? It's a little trick. Why did I do it? Why do you think I wanted to learn all your names? I'm sorry I didn't get to meet you. Okay, nice to meet you, rookie. And Laura's up there on the video. Why did I learn all your names? Establish rapport, to connect. Okay, Deborah, you can't answer. I want all the students <laughs> to answer. You can't answer. Guys, by the way, I went to law school. You heard that, Georgetown? And do you guys know what the Socratic method is? What's the Socratic method, Alicia? Actually, the Socratic method is what they teach in law school is, I'm going to make you do all the work. <laughs> okay? I'm going to ask great questions, and you're going to answer them. That's the first reason I know your names. Okay? Because how am I going to get you to participate unless I can look in your eyes and ask you questions? And when you roll with me, you roll with participation. That's how it works. So we're going to spend two hours together, and I want to make it worth your while, and I want to give to each of you what you've come here to get. What's the second reason I know all your names? You want to try, Lindsay? Yeah, I know all your names. Look at that. <laughs> 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 
Do I have the mic on, Laura? Yes. OK. Um, yeah, team building, and I want to build rapport with all of you for sure. What else? Who's read uh, Dale Carnegie? Who knows who Dale Carnegie is? It's a book from 1936. Krishna, tell me who he is and what he wrote. He's a, he's a speaker He was a motivational speaker and author. He wrote the book in 1936, and he, he'd be dead now. But um, <laughs> he wrote a book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And in How to Win Friends and Influence People, what did he say about your name? Danielle says this. Dan, Dale Carnegie said that your name is the most important word you'll ever hear. It's the thing you respond to. We're all human beings. We're built on survival. And so the most important word to us is our name. So if I learn the most important word to each of you, and I do that, what does that tell you about me relative to you guys? Sam, you want to try that one? That you're important, that I care, that I'm interested, that I got your back, that I want to build a relationship, right? I took the time to shake each one of your hands, to meet you, to tell you some of you had pansy handshakes, which if you're looking for a job and you give a pansy sh handshake and you're a woman, you're giving all your power away. And if you're a man, you're going to be judged. And so the first impression you make is your handshake. The first impression I want to make to each of you, and I want you to be able to make to everyone you come in contact, is to care enough to remember their names so they sh you show this thing. Because this is about guides to crushing it in the real world. And I, I'm going to talk about American culture, or Western European culture, because that's what I know about. But in this culture, in this world, in this part of the country, you got to show up. And showing up means you're present, and you're there. And that's how we do business in this country. That's how we meet people. That's how we get the promotion. That's how we get the sale. That's how we get the job. That's how we create this vision of leadership so we can give back to the world and make things happen. So I'm going to ask each one of you, we focus on leadership training. We focus on teaching people how to connect with other people, how to tell their story, how to make an impression, how to make an impact, how to communicate. And we're coaches, and we do training, and I get the pleasure to do this thing that I'm doing for you about 200 times a year. And I love it. I love it because it's about you. That's what I'm going to bring to you. I'm going to give you the hacks on how to crush it in the real world with whatever you're doing. Biomedical, engineering, they all relate to one business. And do you know what that business is? What's the business that we're all in, Janine? The people business. Thank you. Give that woman a book. Jared, do we have a book? <laughs> all right, we have a book. First one out the gate. And anyone who answers questions can get one of our books. And Janine's got the first book. All right. You. Can you catch? <laughs> Heavy. OK. So we're in the people business. And so I want to hear from each one of you in the two hours that we have today what I can deliver to you based on what I've done. You've heard a very boring, my least favorite topic is myself, but you've heard a boring thing. I've been in sales. I've been in leadership. I've run teams. I've grown businesses to a billion dollars in sales. I've had 4,000 employees that have worked for me, and I've worked for some of the best minds. I've also done a ton of philanthropic stuff, and we've built a business to teach people how to connect. What do you want to learn from me today? Let's have a couple of examples. What can I give you? Robert, what are you looking to get out of today? Speak louder, please. How to build a business. How to build a business? All right, I'm going to try to touch on that one. I would tell you that it relates to people. That's a big, big question. But OK, you want to know how to build a business. Sam, what do you want to know? How to effectively manage a team on a collaborative research project. OK, that's a big question. What do you think it boils down to? And if I told you Janine had the answer, I'd be telling you the truth. <laughs> um, what do I think it boils down yeah. to? Like, how do manage yeah. Um, what does it boil down to in its simplest, purest for, for, form? I mean, communication. Communication. People and communication. I'll buy that. We're going to talk about that today. You will learn or have an aha moment about how to do that tonight, for sure. What else, Israel? What did you have to sacrifice to get to where you are? OK. Dan, I've heard this thing called grit. 
And I heard that actually to get somewhere, you have to sacrifice some stuff. What did I have to sacrifice is more, that's pretty irrelevant. It's what you might have to sacrifice that's probably I care more about. Because who's the hero of this presentation? Who's the hero of this presentation? Nelly, speak up, when, especially when you have the right answer. I am, Nelly says, I am the hero of this presentation, Dan. Yes, us, I am. And so Dan, give me some hints on what sacrifice looks like, what it means like, how you can balance life, how you can have it all. How you can be married for 34 years, have three children, two of which are older than probably most of the people in this room, and still work and still stay healthy and enjoy life and do all those things. What'd you have to give up? A lot, but I got way more than I gave. I promise you. Alicia. Uh, I would like to know how to influence people without having authority. Uh, how to uh, come up, uh, how to join a new team, for example. Yeah. Okay, uh, in the right direction, maybe not your direction, in the team's direction, in the direction that seems the right to make the biggest impact. Dan, how do I influence and create impact in a way that creates respect for people so they'll follow my lead? Is that the question? Yeah. Okay, I'll take that question. What else? Yeah, Cindy. What's, uh, how do you create an effective elevator pitch for your own Okay, we're gonna talk about that. Dan, if the most important thing is people, and the most important thing I'm gonna do is connect with people. What do I do to connect in a quick and concise way to demonstrate that there's something of value that I have to bring to them? I like that question. It's a really good question. And it falls into kind of what our book's about. Aiden. How, how do you define success? How does that drop? How do you decide? Okay, so that's. I can tell you what I believe in it, but really that's not as relevant as what you believe. Each person has their own metric for success. I can tell you how companies have worked with it, I can tell you the companies that do well with it, and I can tell you what I think the world is about, which I believe the world is about three things, right? And it's about vitality, which is who are we and how do we describe ourselves, and what impact are we gonna have and how do we grow ourselves to become learners. It's about connection, how do we create relationships with other people? And then it's about contribution. Those are the three areas that I use to define success, but every person has a different belief of what those three buckets mean to them and how they want to apply them in their life. And that's what makes the world go around. That's cool. What other questions do we have? Yeah, back there. How do you what? How do you make yourself stand out? The first way to make yourself stand out is what? And I've touched on that. Handshake. You give a good friggin' handshake when you walk in the door, which is like, well, I shocked you when you came in. You came in a little bit late and I gave her my hand. She's like, who are you? Don't touch me, back <laughs> off, buddy. But how do you give a good handshake? So the first thing, so it's firmer. It's firmer than that, especially if it's a woman, because some women tend to give the dainty handshake and you want me to, you want equal, then act equal. And equal is we give a good handshake when we meet someone. And so it's firm. It, I like it to last a second longer, just a second shy of awkwardly uncomfortable creepy guy. <laughs> and kind of looking in the eye and making sure that it says, look, I'm here. I am here to meet you and I'm gonna make an impact for you and you are gonna have a difference by knowing me. First step. But then it goes back to Cindy's step, which is how do we communicate our value, tell our story, tell a pitch, we'll get into that stuff. Anyone else have some stuff they wanna learn? Again, this is about you, I'm gonna give you what you want. Yes? Uh, well, I would like to um, um, show, show what, I, what, I, what I really uh, show myself to other people. Mm -hmm. to, to these people see what I'm doing. Really uh. I think that sometimes that's kind of... So Dan, how do I demonstrate the value that I want to have for other people and the impact quickly and concisely in a way that means something so we can, we can provide value to each other and create maybe some results together. Is that the question? Yeah. I like that question. Good question. Yes, Kelly. If you don't have a lot of experience with team building or leadership and uh -huh. starting out, what are, I guess it will be different for everyone, but what are some things that you would 
are some of the big challenges that you might come across? And then yeah. The so be? Dan, um, I'm not necessarily been a team leader. I've been in school. I'm young. Um, I think we, we're going to talk about the fundamentals of human relationship building. And I think we do. I'm going to use a really technical term here. You guys ready for it? I think we suck at teaching how to build relationships and how to collaborate with people. We don't teach it in high school. We don't do a good job of teaching it in college. You're going to learn it tonight. We don't do a good job at Georgetown in graduate school or at law school or when you get to the law firm or to the big fancy company. We don't train how to build relationships. And team building is about connecting and building relationships. So hopefully tonight, you will learn some tricks and tips on how to do that. You want something else? You don't just want one. You want two. Go, Alicia. Uh, so we are here in America, we, are, we live in a multicultural world. Yes. There are so many issues with regard to this. And uh, leading multicultural teams is one of the things that I think is very important for future entrepreneurs and Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, Dan, I would like to learn something more about that here. Okay, I'm going to teach you something. I'm, I think it's important enough that if the only thing you take away from tonight is this one thing about multi multicultural teams and diversity and other people, you take away this thing. So I'm going to say it before I get to my slide. Who knows what the golden rule is? What's the traditional golden rule? Who said that? Israel. Thank you. And he didn't raise his hand, but the voice arose like the Sphinx from nowhere. Yes, the original golden rule is treat others the way you want to be treated. OK. That is not the trick to dealing with multicultural teams, because if I treat someone the way I want to be treated, and I come from a completely different culture, I've missed the mark completely. White boy, New York City, roles a little bit different, right? Someone from Asia or Africa doesn't understand my language. So I need to follow this rule called the platinum rule. Who knows what the platinum rule is? Sergey, do you know what the platinum rule is? No, but we're going to tell you it so you can bring it back to Russia. OK. What is the platinum rule? Uh, listen and be open to other cultures. I love that. It's not the platinum rule, but I love the, I love the sentiment. What's your name? Your name was again? I'm Oscar. Oscar. Nice to meet you, Oscar. Everyone meet Oscar. Um, what is the platinum rule? Yes, Catherine. Catherine, give that woman a book. <laughs> so that is the most important thing. And I'm out of books, but if you want a book, you'll know where to reach Jared, and he will get you a book. Or at the end, we'll get you a book around the break. Um, treat others the way they want to be treated. Do you want to know to deal with multicultural things? You just keep that rule in your head. There are tons of tricks to figure that out. What's the best way to figure out how someone wants to be treated? The absolute best way. Ask questions. Ask questions is awesome. Ask them. You want to know how someone wants to be spoken to, how someone interprets language, how someone's going to synthesize, how someone will work in a team, how someone feels? Ask them. But the trick to asking questions is the most important skill that I could leave you with today. It's actually the trick about understanding your story, eventually. Let's get there. So let, let's roll on some of this. Oh, my clicker's not working, which is not good for me, by the way. Um, OK, so I want you guys, I want to leave here with all the things you said, helping you create your own system. And each of you are going to be different for connecting and engaging with people. It's the number one thing that I'm going for tonight. And if I'm steering wrong or you're not getting it, push me. Because I love to be challenged. And more importantly, again, this is not about me. This is about each of you. We developed one in the book. Part of it is learning how to tell your story. And we're going to go through those things. But I totally want you to understand that. Let's get some stuff out of the way in terms of our book is about, and we are generational experts. You see behind me five diverse people from different age groups. Those are the generations in the workplace. There's never been a more diverse workplace than now. There are five generations in the workplace. OK? Your great grandpa could work with his great grandchild. Thanks, Jared. If you could figure out how to fix that, there's a big bonus for you. Maybe free lunch tomorrow. <laughs> so there are five generations in the workplace. How many have ever sat through a talk that's on generations, or generations in the workplace or in life? Israel. Laura over there did, yes. Catherine, they're usually 
have all these buckets of the descriptions of the generations about what each generation is like. You guys think I like those boxes or not? Who says I don't like them? Okay, you're right. Why don't I like them? Yeah, Janine. They kind of just put, um, make assumptions. They're boxes. Mm -hmm. Right, Oscar? Yeah. Well, is that what you said? It's not a one size fits all thing. It's not a one size fits all. That says that if you're Gen Z under 19, you're socially connected, you're digital native, and you have high self esteem. Self -esteem. You guys have met me for a few minutes, and I may be 53, but I have high self esteem. I can <laughs> promise you that. OK? And I also actually like technology. And I'm kind of ambitious. I am a boomer. But I also have civic pride. I think that's a bunch of nonsense. And I think what we need to do is, Alicia, you asked the question, follow the platinum rule, which is we need to learn. Now, we need to understand that if you're born in those different areas, you came to life differently. The old guy like me, guys, I want to tell you that when I started practicing law, as a young associate, I did not have email. <laughs> we did not have computers. We had typewriters that were automatic. Okay? I just the world was different. I know that's not relevant anymore to anyone, but it's the context of what it was like. And 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 so this whole generational thing, and, and you guys need to understand that um, there's a big disconnect out there. Thanks. Oh, there you go. Thanks. There's a big disconnect out there. And who's heard this term millennial? Who knows what a millennial is? Sam, do you know the ages of a millennial? Um, I believe it's ages like 30 through 18. 30 through 18. 22 to 37. So born between 1980 and 1997. How many of you are millennials in this room? OK, quite a bit. And then the rest of you are probably Gen Z. And then there's a couple of us others, right, Francis? <laughs> Cindy, maybe? Where they are, OK. You're a Gen X. OK, so there you go. And so um, the thing is this. There's such a negative context about millennials, and the world is so polarized. Um, but this generational issue has been around since the beginning of time. Socrates complained about Plato having bad manners, chewing with his mouth open, doing all the things you shouldn't be doing. Um, and. Why is it so heightened now? Why is this negativity so heightened now? What's the biggest change in the world if this generational issue has been around forever? Give me someone else. Social media? Who said that? Nelly? Eh, kind of, sort of. What's the biggest change in the world? Technology. technology. Yeah, technology has changed. And so it's just much more apparent the difference of what's going on in the world. But here's the statistics. When we wrote a book about millennials in the workplace and how to connect the generations and how to lead diverse teams, how millennials manage up, how managers manage millennials. And I can tell you that it doesn't matter because the world has shifted. 40% of the workplace today are millennials. Next nine years, it'll be 75% of the workplace. And 2.4 billion of the world's population is a millennial or are millennials. 60% of the world's population is under the age of 30. Whether we like them or not, it doesn't matter. And by the way, they're just human beings. They just grew up a little bit differently. And the talk track is completely negative. But they have the power. And they have the power not only as employees. They have the power as consumers. Because they control $660 billion worth of spend. 73% of you millennials, when you get to the workplace, will be making purchasing decisions. And so you have the power. And even at home, these Gen Z kids decide what vacation to go on, what car your parents should buy, what house to buy. And so the world is just completely different. And innovation has changed us. Uber has put the taxi cab industry on its heels. Airbnb, now the fifth largest hotelier. And the hotel industry doesn't know what to do. Direct consumer is changing retail at a pace that's insane. And if you go back years, look what happened to Kodak because they didn't go to digital. So they're dead. Probably most of you don't even know what Kodak is. And so the world is completely different. I want you guys to all understand this, because this is how people are perceiving you when you get to the workplace. In, in this group or in this bucket where the talk track is super negative, that you're entitled, that you're lazy, 
that you're disloyal, that you don't know what you want. It's a crock of shit. None of it's true. We've trained 12,000 of you over the past three years, and I'm gonna come straight out of the closet and tell you, you're amazing. Like, you're amazing. And you're pushing us to levels with contribution and connection and doing things differently and being transparent. Look at Parkland. It's amazing. And so it's nonsense, but it's out there. And I want you guys to understand that, that when you tell your story, you need to make sure how you're coming across and that it is about the value you bring. Because I go to colleges a lot and I speak to them. What do you think the number one question from college kids are to me? The number one question is to me. Anyone have a guess? It deals with moolah, money, cash. What do you think the question is? How do I make money? How do I make money or b b I, here's how it kind of comes out. How do I get paid what I'm worth? And here's the answer to that question. I hate to tell you it. How do you demonstrate the value you're going to bring? Because no one gives a crap about you. Most people are self-focused. So you go demonstrate value, which is what you have to give up to be successful. You have to reframe your mind that it ain't about you. It's about the world. And so I just want to kind of put that out there. Any questions or comments about millennials in the workplace? All right, there's still a big disconnect. And Jared's going to press the button again, and you're going to see a little movie about what that disconnect looks like for a minute. Hit there it. are no credits on commercials. Then you got the Clio. It's your job. I give you money, you give me ideas. You never say thank you. That's what the money is for. You're young, you will get your recognition. And honestly, it is absolutely ridiculous to be two years into your career and counting your ideas. Everything to you is an opportunity. And you should be thanking me every morning when you wake up along with Jesus for giving you another day. That's the problem with the real world. It actually sounds like that. When I get to do keynotes in front of 1,000 people, that disconnection is super clear. And while when I say who said that before, no one raises their hand. When I say who's thought that before, everyone raises their hand. So you know half of them have said it, OK? <laughs> but that's the big challenge that you're going to get when you're out there is they don't understand that you young people have no memory of the way it was that you didn't have to, like um, Don Draper did, walk three miles to the bus uphill barefoot without shoes and then walk back home. He thinks you should have a memory of the way it was when there was just a fax machine and no email. And you should just stay there because even though there's nothing to do, that's what you did in the olden days to prove that you were loyal. And not that you could go home and work at 3 in the morning and be five times more efficient and add five times more value. That doesn't matter to him. And he can't stand or she can't stand how you use text instead of you communicate, just talking to them. Now, I think you're great at communicating and you want that human touch and that we will see a shift back to understanding the platinum rule, which is make it about the people, have conversations, connect and um, we'll get there. But the disconnection in the workplace is costing us big, big money. I just want to point it out to you. Actually, in turnover and in hiring people and in all those things, 70% of millennials in the workplace are disengaged or disconnected. And it costs us $450 billion in wasted resources a year, Gallup determines. And so it's a big challenge. I just want you to understand that that's what's going on in the workplace so you understand your audience when you're trying to get the job or trying to collaborate with older people. Yeah? By disengagement, do you mean disengagement with their, with their team or with their coworkers? I mean uh, disengagement with the workplace. Wanting to look for another job, not being happy, thinking there's something else out there, wanting to make a shift, not being satisfied. Um, yeah? The way that work it is, uh, is expecting that the uh, work will be like it you want it. I, I don't know if I made clear. No, <laughs> but you can try again. Okay, so I was telling that most of, I heard most of millennials are uh, waiting for the uh, perfect job that will fit their yeah. perfectly. 
and not uh, like the old way you get a job, any job, and yeah. you drive your best to yeah. to that job. Yeah. Um, I think there's a challenge with millennials. The, 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 the comment was, I've heard that everyone's waiting for the perfect job. And they don't want to take the wrong job, and they want to have purpose, and they want to have all the things that they think they have and they should deserve. And it's not more of, hey, we just take what we can get and we learn, and it's a journey, and it's about the journey and what we live along the way. And I would say that that is true, but that is a condition of youth. Where youth and experience meet is where magic happens. And when we're young, we think that way. We don't necessarily think about are we putting in dues? Do we even need to put in dues? Um, the use of technology and the access to information so quickly and rapidly for you sometimes covers up the fact that you actually might need life experience to understand how to apply that information and that it all can't be read from paper and that you need to understand the people. Um, the statistics show that millennials that are satisfied in a job, and I can tell you what millennials want in the workplace, which is, uh, what do you think is the number one thing millennials want in a workplace so they're not disengaged? Yeah, Janine. Um, purpose. Purpose is up there in the top four, but it's not the number one thing. What do you think it is, Gunn? Uh, acknowledgement. Acknowledgement is um, not even in the top four, but it is something certainly that everyone wants acknowledgement and rewards. And by the way, what I'm talking about is not only for millennials, it's, you know, we're all human beings. So there's not that much difference. What's the number one thing you want in a job if you're going to take a job? Good pay. Money is actually the last thing on the list for young people. Good environment. And what does a good environment do for you, Victoria? Responsibility. How? What do you want from a job, guys? Self worth. Self worth. I want self worth too. Is that Francis? Do you have an answer? I think a challenge. Okay. I'm going to tell you what it is, guys. It's the ability. Yeah. What did you say? Space to grow. Yeah, the ability to learn and grow. You want capability. You want mad-ass skills that are going to get you better, that are going to take you on the track to life to deliver more value to other people. Each of you asked me for that when I got here. Each of what you asked me for was, Dan, tell me the secrets so I can learn more, so I can do more. That's why you're here. That's why you're engaged. That's why you're asking questions, because you want to know how to do things better, how to lead teams, how to collaborate, how to influence people. These are big concepts. That's the number one thing that millennials want in the workplace. And the truth is, the statistics show if you give young people that and show them you have their back and you care about them, and you teach them things like learning how to tell your pitch, learning how to tell your story, learning how to ask amazing questions like you talked about, if you teach them that, they will stay with you longer. That's what you guys want. You want to learn how to be better so you can create a difference in your life and in the world. That's what millennials want in the workplace. Working it's working again. I think so. If not, I'll just go back to it. Okay. And he'd be right. Look at that. So I just want to point out to you, and now we'll get into kind of the tips of leadership, is that the book has and there is a system to really understand how to bridge the gap with anyone of any generation or any diverse background by, first thing we do is bust myths. Millennials are not all lazy. They're not all entitled. They work hard. They're tech savvy. They have innovative, creative ideas, and they want to bust rules and do things quicker. And all the old people like me are not only care about their BMW, don't care about people, don't care about growing people, only care about the bottom line, not tech savvy, live by the other golden rule, which is I make the go I got the gold, I make the rules, sit down and shut up. They want to learn from you. They understand that where youth and experience meets. So they're both a bunch of myths. So we got to bust them. So today I had a, I, we do coaching on demand. And I had a call from a client that said to me, here's what my partner's going to do to me. I'm like, why are you assuming that your partner, assume some positive intent. Why are you going to assume the worst thing? Don't assume that. He's not going to steal from you. He's your partner. He may want to understand what's going on with this particular client that he knew at a particular time, but don't assume the worst. So that's about busting myths. What is about real deal? It's the number two thing millennials want in the workplace, which you guys didn't talk about. What do you think the number two thing millennials want in the workplace? 
It sounds like real deal. It's not recognition. And then you work-life balance. Work-life balance is always this amorphous thing that everybody wants. It's not necessary. I mean, everybody wants that. So, so look at the words, real deal. Millennials want trust. They want it told to them real. They want it authentically because you guys have been bombarded with messages. You're the first generation that you go on your computer, you buy a pair of shoes on Amazon, and for the next eight months, they're delivering you up some type of derivation of that shoe, sock that fits the shoe, laces for the shoe, a new heel for the shoe, another pair of the shoe in a different color. And so you want to be told honestly, that was good, that wasn't good, here's how you get better. And as, a, as, as, as workplaces, we're not very good about having uh, difficult conversations and conflict when things were good. When, so the number two thing to do is to be real and ask questions that matter and listen. Number three is I own it. What do you think that means? It's I and the bridge thing. What does I own it mean? Janine. Yeah, being self-aware, having accountability, meaning who's the only person you guys can control in this entire room? Yourselves. Exactly. You got to own that. You have a bad relationship with your boss? Change yourself because you ain't changing your boss. That's not going to work. You have a bad relationship with your team? What do you do, Alicia? You try a different way, right? You got to ask different questions. You got to approach it from a different way. You want to be a real leader? You're going to stay up five nights in a row figuring out how to do it better and what resonated with the person. How do I apply the platinum rule to this guy and this gal and get them together and on board on the same thing? That's about owning what you can control. So you got to own that to bridge the gap with other people and disparate teams. Delivering value, what's that about? We're going to talk about that. Who knows what WIFM is? W-I-I-F-M. Anyone hear that acronym? Nobody? Ash, you've never heard that? What's in it for me? Most people are focused on, they like their name, and they want to know, what are you going to do for me today? Dan, what are you going to tell me that makes a difference for me? Because otherwise, I don't give a crap, basically. So what do you think the secret to success is to figure out how to deal with those types of people, which is everyone. It's a natural human condition. It's called survival. We make it with them. I got to figure out what's in it for them. So I got to be figuring out what value can I bring to that other person, and how do I treat my communication and words in a way that delivers value to the audience? Because nobody cares about it unless you can do something to help them. And that's crude, and that's kind of the guttural thing. I mean, people are generally nicer than that, and I'm an optimistic guy. But you want to learn the secret to manage teams? Understand what's in it for the team. Understand their why. Understand what it's going to do, how it's going to give back, what they're made of. And goals are, we really got to understand the goals of the whole team. Their individual goals, their team goals, their big company goals, their customer goals. This is gold, these rules. And then the last one is empowering success, and that's figuring out how to create a culture where we can own our own stuff to coach ourselves, live by the platinum rule, focus on with them, and kind of get it all together so we can win. Those are the things. So I'm going to ask you this question. What do you, and if I had another book, I would give it to the right person if they got the answer. What do you think is the most important life work skill? You want to know the real secret, Alicia? I'm still trying to practice it as much as possible. It's listening. Listening is definitely a good answer, and it's the number two in those 200 keynotes that I get is the number two most popular answer. I'm looking for more. I want better and deeper. Chris, empathy, I love that. You are a nice guy. Somebody date this boy. <laughs> empathy. I mean, that's awesome. Nelly? Mm -hmm. Communication is the number one answer. But it's still it, communication, listening, empathy. They're all a part of the right answer, and you're not there yet. Help me. Yeah. Balance. balance. I like balance, and we all want balance. You want to try again. You're the two. Flexibility, balance, all that stuff is really good, Oscar. I was going to say intuition. 
Into, I love intuition, too, is a good answer, but it's not the right answer, Deborah. Okay, now you can go. They've participated. How you treat people. So here's the answer, guys and gals. It's not that complicated. The most important life work skill is building relationships, which all of those things are part of it. Why is building relationships the most important life work skill? Who wants to help me out there? Who knows why that is? Yes. We're all people, Danny. Nothing we do. People control power. They control money. They control information. They control products. They're on my team. I got to work with them. They got to give me my latte at Starbucks in the morning. People are what the world's about. So if I don't know how to build relationships, Cindy, I have no one to tell my story or pitch to. I got nothing. And so the number one life work skill is building relationships. Again, in the certificate course, do you have a course on building relationships? I'd like to help you build that, Gwen. But do you have one just focused on that? We don't. We don't. Okay. We need that. Because they're tools like asking great questions, the perspective, how you figure out how to bust the myths, how you assume positive intent, how you understand that there's self-accountability and how you shift self-awareness and how you can tell a story that connects with people that delivers value to them and makes it about them and less about you. So I, again, another crystal to take away is if you can master relationship building, you can own the world. And, and for all of us that are in science, where's the world going technologically? AI, robotics, all things that don't require people. What is the one distinction that's going to be left <laughs> the more that technology goes? It's that human touch. It's that understanding. It's that connectivity. So not only in your personal lives, but in your professional lives, the ability to build relationships is so important. Cross-cultural, right? Keeping peace. There's so many things. So. Can I get an amen to that? <laughs> Can I get an amen to that? Amen. amen, okay. Building relationships is the most important life work skill. So how do we create them authentically with employers, teams, clients? That's what we want to know. How do we do that? How are we going to figure out to do that? Anyone have any ideas? Because even though I wrote a book on it, and by the way, I want to tell you something about that relationship thing before I move on. That's scientifically based. The longest study on adult education from Harvard, if you've seen that TED talk, will show you that they've studied, I think, 1,200 men since 1935. It's over a 75-year study on what was the biggest impact on success, which included monetary success. It included longevity, meaning you live longer the number one theme, they tested their blood, they questioned their wives, because it was 1935, they only did men. They did every single test, and the one thematic for success economically and happiness in life was the power of the quality of the relationships that they had, that they controlled building. You control that, right? The one person you can control is who? Yourself. Guys and gals, there is no difference in the real world than those particular th things. And how to create them is what we want to know. And I believe, Cindy, that part of that is the ability to share information and communicate our story. You can call it a pitch. I call it kind of connection currency, and it's our story. Why do you think um, telling our story is so important? Karen, you got any ideas on that? It totally helps us to connect with others. And why through story? Why is story so important? Yeah. Our brain is prone to, uh, to process them in a whole way. So if it's a story, it's almost like an image for us. Yeah, so um, Dan, we're designed as human beings. Human beings care about creating. That's the thing that separates us from most of the other the world and, and most of the animal. 
um, kingdom, which is the way we communicate, the way we can do those things, were designed and built that way. And storytelling for centuries and centuries has been the number one way that we connect and communicate information. How many of you took a class? I, I know at the entrepreneurial thing, there was like a storytelling summit, wasn't there? Yeah. At the Ignite thing? There was. So I love that. So that's good. That's a good start. How many of you can tell your story in a concise way in three minutes about who you are, where you come from, what's your experience been, and what value you can bring to other people? Yeah, not good, right? <laughs> not good. Our book believes that the ability to connect the generation is to learn how to tell your story in a way that's with them, what's in it for the listener, so you can demonstrate who you are, what you want to do in those buckets, right? Of vitality, connection, and contribution, how you want to impact the world. That's about what the connection is through storytelling. And it's super critical. So what is the message you want to tell through your first handshake? What is the message you want to tell someone when you want to get a job, when you want to shift or influence someone's opinion? How much time are you spending thinking about those things and creating a, yeah? Anybody spend time thinking about those things? Yeah, you do? I like that. And so the question is, what do you want your message to be? What do you stand for? Because I wear what I stand for on this silly little bracelet on this hand, which are my three words, right? My three words, which are, here's the way I want to measure myself both aspirationally and hold myself to the standard, too, is I want to be bold. Because like I said, you're the hero of this. And I want to create an impact for each of you to think in a different way that reshapes the way you value and create relationships with other people. I want to be generous, which is why I'm here. I'm not getting paid for this. I could be home with my family having dinner. But I'm here because I want each of you to have the gift of being able to tell stories like this to connect with other people. And my third word is empowering. So it's bold, generous, and empowering, which is I don't only want you to get it, but I want you to practice it and be it and do it, because otherwise it's worthless to just hear it. I want to shift it. So my story relates around those three words. Uh, I got a lot of history. You know, the, the intro was, I still have wrestled with how do you do an intro that really tells your story. And I can share my full story with you, which is where am I from? Like, what am I made of? Why does the word no? send me into a tizzy. Like, you'll see, even at a restaurant, if I ask, can they put chicken on this particular salad, and they have chicken, and they have the salad, and they say no. <laughs> that, like, I, I almost need to leave the restaurant. <laughs> so why is that about me, and what does it create in have, having me help people? Those are the things, that's how in tune that I want you to get with your story. I've asked you a number of times who's the hero of this presentation, but I haven't asked you who is the hero of the story you'll tell? Your story. Who's the hero of your story? Who, who's the hero? You, yourself? Nope, wrong answer. Who's the hero of your story? The audience is the hero of your story because you're trying to create a relationship and create impact. And that's, I think, the problem that we don't understand in our pitches, which is if we ask some great questions, what the people want. What did I ask you when I first came? What's the first question I asked you? What do you want to learn? How can I serve you today? Because that's what you want to know from the listener of your story. So if you sit in an interview and someone says, tell me about yourself, what would you like to know about myself and in what context? And you know, do you want to just know generally? Or what's the best way to serve you with my story? I got three words that I think of myself. I got things I'm good at. What do you want to learn? So I really want you guys to under, you know, another one of those tips, leave the understanding. Every time you talk, the hero of who you're 
talking to, the hero is the person you're talking to, the receiver of the communication. It's a good tool for leading teams, right? That they're the hero. You've ever heard of servant leadership? Who studied or knows what servant leadership? What is that? Gun. You, you're a leader to serve others. Basically. You're a leader to serve others, right? Exactly. Same thing. You're a storyteller to serve others. To create some impact for both of you to do business together, to create a relationship, all those things. Okay. When we talk about our book and I'm going to teach you things, I say we, talk, we work from the inside out. What does that mean? Sean? Yeah? We should start from ourselves. Yeah. You got to start from knowing yourself. If you don't understand yourself and you can't articulate your value, how are you going to be able to communicate that to other people? How are you going to be able to help them? And a lot of the times people will tell me wherever I go, especially since we're millennial experts, that young people don't know what they want. I call bull on that. I think you know what you want. I think we haven't done a good job of teaching how to articulate what that is and experience it in a way that serves others. And so we got to figure it out. So we have a system. I'm just going to walk you through it quickly, and then I'm going to let you take a break, which is understand the power of relationships. We did that a little bit. We didn't do it fully, but here's the system. Know your strengths. Why do we focus on strengths? Why do you think we focus on strengths? Anyone here take Strength Finder or any of the assessments? Does anyone know what Strength Finder is? Yeah, show of hands. Good. Cool, that's awesome. So you guys are f step up on understanding yourselves. Why do we study strengths? If you took that. Someone else. Why do we study strengths? John, do you know why we study strengths? Well, I guess uh, it's, it's like a kind of world out there, and so whatever you're better at um, will go a lot further. Dan, the answer is you're probably much better at what you're naturally good at, and you're probably going to have a lot more fun doing it. And so if we tap into what you're naturally good at, and we understand how to communicate that, I'm probably much more likely to be successful in connecting with someone or delivering value or implementing all these things exactly. Not weaknesses, strengths. I'm not saying we can't shore up our weaknesses, but let's do what we love to do. We're probably naturally good at it. Our skills, passions, and values, we layer that on top. Why? Why passions? and why the things we value. Someone else. Sorry. I'm just trying to get other people to participate. Bang, you got an answer for me? Do you have an answer? Why we do skills, passions, and values? Okay, so if you, yeah, if you understand the next, sure, if you understand the next level of impact you have by understanding what you love to do, what your why is, what you're passionate about, how you want to help, and what you can do to help, then that probably even ups your game above those things that you're naturally good at. And if you can communicate them in a language which we use the with them language, it really works. What's a personal brand? Catherine? Um, like who you are and what mm. Your personality, right? They're the five P's of branding, but your personality really, what you bring to the world, what you want to be known as, right? Bold, empowering, and generous. That's my brand. That's who I am. Again, another language to start talking about the impact you want to create and have on people and building relationships. And then the, we, we take all that that basic knowledge, and then we put it in your pitch. Cindy, that's what we do. And we teach you how to tell your story in a three-minute way. When you would never tell your story in three minutes, because that's verbally assaulting someone or puking on them. <laughs> three minutes is a long time to talk without asking a question in an interview or a sales talk. 
sales proposal. You want to break it down. You want to have an outline of three minutes, which is, who am I? And I'm, or, right, who am I? Which is, where am I from? Which is not, I'm from Texas, but I grew up in a family where my grandfather was the patriarch, and here's what I learned. I grew up in a military family. I'm about service and protecting people, right? I grew up in the big city where I had to watch my back all the time, and I learned, right, how to trust instinct and be intuitive. What's my experience? What are the things I've applied that to? And what's worked and how has it helped others? And the third part is what value. And you get that outline and you take it with you wherever you go. And is your story the same every time you tell it? Victoria, is your story the same every time you tell it? Why not? Because your audience changes exactly. Your audience changes and so you got that outline and if you're asking questions back and forth, so the first thing is, where are you from? And then you do a little bit of that and what's made you who you are. And then you ask them, where are you from? Right? You do question asking, Chong. And so then you get the back and forth. But you've got to have this outline. And that's what real leaders understand is their outline, their posture, the impact they want to have. OK. Um, are we going to take a five minute break in the middle? Yeah, we can. OK. Um, let's do that and then we'll get into leadership. You guys okay with that? Any questions before we take a break? All right, go take a five minute break and come on back and we'll talk about leadership. Are we ready to go? Okay, um, interestingly enough, Francis said to me who had to leave and then Gunn asked me the same question, he said, um, all this stuff sounds very familiar and very rooted in um, Judeo-Christian -Christ ethics and things like that. And here's what I'm here to tell you. There are very few new ideas when it comes to dealing with people and leadership. And most of the stuff I'm talking about is borrowed from the likes of Napoleon Hill, Dale Carnegie, Keith Ferrazzi, um, you name it, Gary V. Does anyone follow Gary V? Yeah, Israel's a look, he loves Gary. I was with Gary V in a couple of months ago. Um, and all these leaders, there's really not a lot of information or new information out there. Uh, Oprah spoke at the USC graduation. Her eight tips, including having great shoes, there was nothing really new about it. Even the great shoes, everyone's got to have great shoes. There's a secret to life. Have good shoes. If you can't afford anything else, make sure you have killer shoes, men or women, um, and that they look good. But there are not a lot of new ideas. And so let's talk about leadership um, for a while. What do you guys think are the qualities of great leaders? What are the qualities of leadership? Or, I mean, you talked about wanting to learn how to lead a team and how to influence people and how to get people to understand your ideas. What are some of the qualities? Uh, first, Israel's hand up was first, then Nelly. Yeah. Uh, lead by example. OK, model great behavior, lead by example, like that. Nelly? And then motivate you to make you want to learn. Um, so a great quality of a leader is someone that inspires or motivates you? OK. Hi, um, Can make good decisions. Can make good decisions or good at, make, at decision making. OK. Kelly? Resourcefulness and adaptability. Resourcefulness and adaptability. AJ? They're confident. They're confident. They care, they care, uh, uh, about, they care about you. Uh, they make you, uh, they like, uh, get make you feel like you are more than just a person around you. They make you feel involved in the project. They care about you and they, 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 they give you passion. Again. They what? They give you passion. They get, well, they give you passion? They, passion. they instill passion or they share their passion or vision? I don't think people can give you passion. Passion is something that you control, but they certainly can share their passion with you that can be effusive, that can make you want to be part of it or follow them. OK, what else do they do? Uh, push you to be your best. They push you to be your best? Motivate you. Motivate you. What else? Yeah, they make it about you. They're servant-based. It's not about them. Deborah? They're ambitious and being within the trenches. They're ambitious. No, um, no vision. 
they have vision, okay? And then being with you in the trenches. When they have vision the and time. most of the time they're there with you. Yes. They're alongside. They got your back, but they're, they're there with you on the battlefield. Karen. Um, they're an effective communication. They're great at communication. Yeah, I like that one. Supportive. Supportive. Um, empathy. We can go back to that, right? All the things that are the most number one life work skill are certainly what leaders have, Sam. Empathy, you were gonna, okay, you guys should meet. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> Alicia? They're ethical. They're ethical? I like that, yeah. They're ethical, they don't just wanna do it, they wanna do it the right way. And the way that, you know, really creates value and doesn't uh, create havoc. What else? Yeah, I, I did uh, um, some research on this, um, and these were kind of the things that if you look and study Howard Schultz and Richard Branson and Warren Buffett and Jamie Dimon from J.P. Morgan and all these folks, you'll see these are the things. Um, we didn't hear curious, but learners and curious. It's the best quality of a leader asking questions so they can understand how to make the great decision, right? Um, what about resilience? What does resilience mean to you guys? Why is that such a powerful thing? Thing for a leader to have, Oscar. Because you can't always win, right? Sometimes you're going to have things that fail. More, more. Not only can you not always win, but where do you learn the most from? Or when you don't win, right? Those are the best lessons usually. That might be some people say is one of the biggest challenges with millennials, is we wanted to make their life so easy that we didn't want them to fail. We didn't teach them how to fail as a generation. And that's actually a cyclical thing if you, if you study generations um, that happens. And then we kind of retreat a little bit back and get better with, with teaching failure, Israel. It's more of a practical question, but when you're going into an interview and you have a significant failure in your life that you overcame with effectiveness, yeah. do you recommend sharing it or just not? Um, what do you guys think the answer to his question is? Who votes that we should share vulnerable things that we overcome. Like what context? Well, well, how, let's get to the context in a second. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Who thinks we should share those things? Yeah, why do you think we should? That's the right answer. Why do you think we should share that? Because you show you're vulnerable and then you have resources to come up. Yeah, De know. Deborah, why is vulnerability so important? Yeah. I, did I spell it right? Yeah, I, I believe, guys, that the number one skill for a leader is actually vulnerability. So the, Nelly got to point two, which is how do you cast that in a way that demonstrates that I'm not a total loser, but that I actually learn something from it. I, um, I'm self-aware, um, it makes sense, it demonstrates the value that I'm gonna bring to you, all those things. But who, who knows who Brene Brown is? use the word vulnerability. Does anyone know who Brene Brown is? Janine, you do? Tell them who Brene Brown is, because I love her. Um, I watched her uh, TEDx talk. Uh -huh. She talks about, um, she's written some books, Daring Greatly. Uh -huh. She talks about vulnerability. She talks about vulnerability. Yeah. And she says the defi do you remember the definition of vulnerability? Can you remember Great and Daring Greatly? Vulnerability is power. Yeah, vulnerability is being able to live in uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. Uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. Where do you think entre entrepreneurs live? <laughs> uncertainty, <laughs> risk, and emotional exposure. You can tell them that, right, Gwen? Yeah, and that is like, that's where Steve Jobs lived. That's probably where all these people lived in their early life. Howard Schultz had to go um, from Starbucks, was not the owner of, original owner of Starbucks and almost got, I don't know if you've read the story, he went to Bill Gates Sr., who was his lawyer, who went to a guy who was trying to steal Starbucks out from under him, and Bill Gates Sr. loaned him the money to do it, but it was all because Howard Schultz was vulnerable with Bill Gates Sr. that he would not let him lose, and he took him took him on as a client even though he didn't have the money because he shared that he was living in uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure, but he had this big idea. 
And so I don't know if you know that, but Bill Gates and his dad, Bill Gates Sr., actually saved Starbucks. And Brene Brown will tell you that she gets paid probably, I don't know, $150,000 a talk for an hour. Um, she's written three books and she's an expert on shame and vulnerability. And CEOs will call her all the time and say, I'd love for you to come and talk at my team meeting. And we know, unfortunately, in the world today, or most CEOs are old white men, <laughs> at least in this country. And um, so when she says, what would you like me to talk about? And they say, well, I don't know. What do you usually talk about? And she says, vulnerability and shame. What do you think they say? Yeah, vulnerability and shame, I don't think that's really good. And so what do you, her answer back to them, if you've studied her, is, well, um, what do you think vulnerability is? And she goes to the three things, and she says, uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. And she said, by the way, I've worked with Navy SEALs all the time, and we work with special forces all the time. And I asked them how much of their life is spent in uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. Everything they do is set there. So basically, she says vulnerability equals courage because it's how you deal with uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. So I love that you guys kind of brought it up. It's my favorite topic. There's an amazing book on it by a guy named Jonathan Fields called Uncertainty, which is teaching you, and at a very young age, you could really learn to adopt these things, how to lean into uncertainty. And it's a super cool book that gives you actually like 10 tips on how to lean into uncertainty, and I love it. So grit, that's another one. What does grit mean to you guys? Amanshu, you haven't? So it's like adherence, sticking to your ideas. St and yeah, it's, so it's, yeah, it's, it's um, stick to itness. What else? What else does it connote? Don't quit. I'm not going to quit. And, and really, most people will say, we talked about millennials, that millennials don't have enough grit. As soon as it gets hard, they don't want to stay late. They don't want to work hard. Not necessarily true. You're wearing a Google, Google shirt. We know that if you've been to the Googleplex and you've had the good fortune to go there with someone, you, you know they give free food. And actually, millennials work pretty hard around the clock. That's why they give the free food. It's not because Google thinks millennials are whiny and they need to feed them, but they've learned that in order to um, create great leaders, we got to keep them there longer. We got to keep them thinking. And by the way, the best way to bond people together is through food. If you've researched the Cornell study on firehouses, they're top, they studied 365 firehouses, and the top performers had what in common? Do you know what they had in common? They ate food together, Nellie, exactly. I'm getting hungry. But they ate food together. And so there are all these things that when we look at leadership and we break down stories and people and relationships, we start to figure that out. Good coper, humility is something that everyone said, right? That's about making it about the other person and making them the hero, being humble. And we have the amazing good fortune of training uh, special forces uh, guys and gals that want to go from deployment to employment on how to tell their story. And if anyone wants to have the most amazing experience of their lives, I mean, I get goosebumps just thinking about it, go to that night where they tell their story. But yet they're so steeped in humility that they don't want to actually, they believe, brag. And we have to work with them and say, no, 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 good leaders are able to describe what value they can bring to other people. It's not about talking about yourself. It's about talking about the impact you want to have to help it about other people. Laura asked me when, uh, during the break, how, did, you know, how do you become a good public speaker? And I gave her a whole bunch of tips. But I told her my biggest, I, and by the way, guys, until about three years ago, I hated speaking in front of people, if you could imagine that, like hated big groups. But I've learned to really love it because my big, big aha moment was it's not about me. It's totally not about me. It's about the impact you get to have on all the people you talk to. 
that's when the leader, like that's when you become a real leader. It's not that I grew a business to a billion dollars and had a private jet and was super successful. It's that I learned the key to life is that it's about the flip. That's what real leaders is about the people you're impacting. It's about the teams. It's about how you talk to the teams. So I just think it's an empathy. Empathy is such a strong, strong um, habit of a leader. Why is that? We've talked a little bit about that. Sam? One of the best ways to build relationships with people is to relate to them. Yeah, to be able to put yourself in their shoes. So empathy allows me to put myself in other people's shoes and see it from their situation. It's the platinum rule, really, right? It gives me kind of this intuitive stuff. And you can really, really hone your intuitive skills. Um, Gunn asked me a question, and immediately I knew where he was from. And I said, where are you from? And that's about intuiting, are you from Korea? And he said, yeah, how'd you know that? That's about honing those intuitive skills that understands what's coming in and what's going out and why you're linking those things together. So um, in a coaching session, we do a lot of coaching on the spot. We call it speed coaching. I can ask someone usually two or three questions and get them to cry by the fourth question. <laughs> Because you're, and it's not that it's a good thing, but you've hit, ah, that's the, right, why is that holding you back? And not everyone cries, especially the Navy SEALs, although some of them cry. Um, <laughs> so I, I want you to take a look at this um, video because I think it sp says a lot about um, bridging the gap between the generations and um, what we need to do for each other, where youth and experience meet. So take a look at it. Oops, or not. This is a pair of Levi's, buttons and rivets and pockets and cuffs, and the thread that holds it together. When the road gets rough and the sky gets jumpy and the stars stop falling on top of your head and the waves stop breaking against your legs, it's the thread in your seams that's tied to your dreams. It's the soul in your feet that keeps the beat. You're gonna be great, you're gonna be great. You're gonna be great, you're gonna find the cure. You're gonna be famous, you're gonna be shameless. Spitting seeds in the wind, tap dancing with your shoelaces pinned to the back of a bus at the end of the road, at the bottom of the ninth with a crown in your head. You're a queen, you're a king. You're the solo act in a sold out show at a six story stadium in your crowd. You're a hero, you got a hero's grip. Swinging by a single stitch. You follow your heart, follow the leader. You're the leader. Are you joking? Are you breaking? Are you shaking? You're the next living leader of the world. You're a kid, holding on to the thread that holds it together. This is a pair of Levi's. What does Levi's understand about your generation and what it takes to really be a leader and what they think? What'd you get from the video? Okay, I'll take that. I don't know that I believe it, but I'll take that as an impression. I don't think that's what they were going for. Certainly they want to win, and they're competitive, and it's about them. Anyone else read something other than they're all fantastically good-looking and skinny? Um, <laughs> Vulnerability. Okay, tell me why you say that, John. So, everyone there is striving for something. Mm -hmm. They have their vulnerable, and they tied it together with this so there's a there's a teamwork aspect of something you have something going for you. What you have going for you yeah. is this is this what's coming together this thread. Yeah. And that's what will allow you to have self confidence when you go into that presentation. John, I like I've just fell in love with you. <laughs> like that is that's probably the best definition in 400 times that I've asked or shown that video about what it is. But yeah, do you remember at the end, you can be anything you want to be. You can be the king, you can be the queen, you can be the solo act of a sold out show in a six floor stadium. Are you joking? Are you kidding? Really? I'm the next living leader of a world. What the heck am I gonna do? It's scary, it's vulnerable. And how do we create a world 
where we can tie that thread together to something and help each other? How do we guide ourselves as young people? And how do we get or acquire mentors or find guides to help us? And are those guides going to lean in? And I would tell you, John, I'm probably betting on it, you would lean in for sure. And the question is, how do we attract and build a world where we can do it? Where are we now in creating leaders? Because 86% of young people are super optimistic about the world. In a world where there's never been more debt from college, in a world where you're entering a generation, you're the first generation to do worse than your parents did, where look at how fractured our political system and how, how polarized we can't even talk to each other. I mean, you can't even have conversations at the family table anymore about politics. And people just don't want to talk about it. And so the interesting thing is, is what are we going to do to guide each other and to find mentors? Let me ask you this question. I think it's a super important question. Who do you think in life is going to be your absolute best mentor? It's a deep question. Ash, you have an answer for me? Who's, going to, who's your best mentor? Jerry? Kelly? You guys are like, Shannon? You guys are like, oh, I don't want to answer that question. Who do you think is your best mentor? Come on, it's not, I don't find you if you answer incorrectly. I just snicker a little bit. Imagine. Yes, I'll you. Okay, I love, so, I, I mean, you're close. I think the best mentor, and guys, part of my story is this. I came, I grew in, up in a super, super poor family with a lot of alcoholism and a lot of abuse, and it wasn't fun. And I was always looking to attract to mentors to figure out a way, how do I pay for my college? How do I get to law school? How do I become successful? How do I become a better husband? How do I, be I become a dad? Because I didn't really have role models for how to do that. How do I do those things? And I was always looking for someone else to tell me the secret. Actually, it's probably the biggest thing that affected my career negatively, which I was always looking for projects for people to help me and people that I could prove to them that I could help them. But the best mentor I will ever have is my own self-awareness of knowing who to attract to, who not to attract to. So you each are your own best mentor. You each are your own best coach. In order to fill these empty seats as leaders, those empty seats, you have to understand that you have that power within, no matter how scary it is. And it's a journey and it's a path. And that's how we win the leadership game, by understanding that and taking it seriously. And understanding the most important relationship we have is with ourselves and we can't give to others unless we understand how to put our oxygen mask on, how to tell our story to provide value to others. We just can't fill the seats. That's what real leaders do. And here's the problem. That's what most of us do about it. No one wants to touch that scary, hard, not comfortable stuff to deal with. It's not fun. But really, if we pull our head out of the sand, and companies too, Companies are not doing a good job. They spend four times as much money on hiring people than they do on training them. Just doesn't make sense because they're leaving and, tur and turnover costs them a ton of money. Disengagement is so high. En di engagement over the past 10 years in the workplace has been flat. Technology has changed like crazy, but engagement in the workplace is flat. It's crazy statistic. And I believe it's because we're not going back to the source. If we teach people, and millennials in particular, or young people, about their number one favorite topic themselves, and we teach them how to build relationships and be better communicators, they're going to be more engaged in our workplaces. They're going to be more engaged in our schools. They're going to be better at teams. And I think that's what we need to understand. How do we do something about it to teach those things? 
So here are my three simple rules to kick ass as a leader. <laughs> show up. What does showing up mean? Who said that? I know you, you always have the right answer, but it's so <laughs> softly spoken, Nelly. Being, being present. Being present, being there, being there, like showing up. Really, like that awkwardly long pause on the handshake, that's a design to show up. The question asking, the caring enough to have people's back, the, the better follow-up question after the first question that shows you're smart, you care, you're curious, you have their back, those are the ways to show up. What does be real mean? What does be real mean? Yeah, transparency. What's that? Be yeah, be authentic, be genuine. Don't, don't take the easy way out when someone asks you for your, your opinion. Challenge them. If someone asked you for your opinion, you can ask for permission. Do you really want to hear the truth? Here's how I experienced you, like a jackass. Because of this, this, and this, and this. And I know you're not that person, so why didn't you do it this way? Being real, again, difficult conversations. I'm not saying that you are honest to the point of, of, of murder. My dad told me, honesty that kills is still murder. But there is a way to communicate reality and be real to people and help them. So if you show up, you're real, you're authentic to who you are, you have your principles, you have your morals, you have ethics, you have vulnerability, you'll win. And then the third rule is make it about others. Because this is true, and John Maxwell said it, although it's attributed to Teddy Roosevelt, is nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. It's that simple. How many of you have heard blowhards or helium hands in classes that just want to hear themselves talk? No one cares about that. I know that's an old school term, helium hands, but sorry, I'm old. Um, nobody cares about how much you know until they know about how much you care. You want to know how to lead a team? Deploy the platinum rule, be able to connect with them, ask them great questions, and demonstrate you care and you got their back. That's how we win. Okay, how about nine real quick tips on how to hack leadership? And this will be how to get the guy or the girl, the promotion, the sale, the client, the job, the opportunity. These are the tips that will take you there. We talked about grit. Everyone wants to be around someone that tenaciously believes at their core that they're going to be relentless to creating impact for that organization. That's grit. I cut you and you say, I'm ready to go again. I work you hard, you take your rest, you come back, you say, let's do it this way again, I'm here. That happened, that doesn't matter. Let's find a different way to approach it. That's what grit is. What do I mean by be prepared? What does that mean? Yeah. There's an old saying uh, that opportunity uh, rewards those who are prepared. Yeah. Opportunity certainly rewards those who are prepared. It means do your homework. I had a young man that came in to a, uh, interview me. I think he was, uh, he was special forces. And he came in to interview me, oh, it probably was about two weeks ago. Um, and I was the 40th CEO that he was interviewing <laughs> for his book. And I came in and he says, tell me about your company. What do you think I said to him? No, I'm not that nice. <laughs> I said, what did I say to him? You tell him. Exactly. What do you know about my company? And he said, I don't know anything. What do you think I said to him then? No, I said, the meeting's over. <laughs> really, I'm going to teach you the most important lesson you'll ever learn. Here's what leadership looks like. I'm going to be honest with you. You're a Navy SEAL. You were taught to be prepared. You lived to fight and serve your country and have every um, possible outcome determined before you got there and you came here and you did not research this company? 
How dare you do that? People's favorite topic is themselves. You're asking me for my time for free and you've done no work on knowing who you're coming to talk to? Shame on you. I mean, like, shame on you. You know what he said to me? He said, no one's ever told me this before. What do you think I said? So, I mean, like, Jared could tell you, I'm probably moving out of my seat at the time. Like, my head's ready to spin off my body. No one ever told him this, a grown 26-year-old Navy SEAL. What did I say to him? No, oh, exactly, you should have known. Are you, are you friggin' kidding me? I mean, like, give me a break, dude. I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm gonna continue to teach you a lesson. I said, share with me some of the rest of those questions. And he started sharing the questions and they were horrible. I mean, they were like, they weren't deep. There were no follow-up questions. He wasn't being intuitive. He wasn't connecting. He didn't tell me a story. He looked exhausted. He was wearing a suit, but he had nothing else. I said, those questions suck. I mean, like no one's ever told you, you've interviewed 40 CEOs, who have you interviewed? Tell me that, because I'm not gonna buy from any of those companies and I'm gonna short those stocks. But like, who have you interviewed and why would you ask? He kept saying to me, no one's ever told me this. And I went back to the, who's your best coach, dude? He did send me an email the other, the next day, and I gave him a book, and I said, read this book, and if you ever want to talk to me again, you better come back prepared. He did send me an email the next day, and what did the email say? Because he probably was taught well by his mom, or at least by the Navy SEALs. It said, thank you. Was that what you were going to guess? Yes, and maybe you all the He apologized, and he said, thank you, but he's never followed up since. So he's dead to me. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, here's what I said to him. You're going to meet 40 CEOs where you have the opportunity to impact and create and network and learn and collaborate and innovate with them. What do you think I think of you? I said, what do you think I think of you? Do you think I think you're great or average? Rate, rate what just happened here. Give yourself a letter grade. He gave himself a D. I would have given him an F. I said, oh, uh, okay, rate yourself. Like, I mean, are you that clueless to understand? Now, hopefully it was, I, if you guys know me well enough, you've spent a couple hours with me or an hour and a half already. I didn't do it to hurt him. I did it to teach him so he wouldn't do the same thing. But he, again, he hasn't followed up. I mean, this was a real opportunity to demonstrate vulnerability and come back as a real leader and demonstrate who he is. And so my gut about him is he's not going to do it. But please be prepared. And being prepared doesn't only mean who the person you're talking to is and how you can provide value to them. It means knowing your story and how you can share that with other people. And you can make it about who's the hero of the story? Who's the hero of the story? The audience. Making it about the audience knowing how your story is going to relate to that particular person. Gets you the sale, it gets you the promotion, gets you the job, it gets you the funding. No new ideas, simple basic connectivity and building relationships. With them, we talked about that. Remember what that is? What is that? It's how do I provide value to them? They only care about themselves or they're human beings, AJ, they're thinking about themselves. You're shaking your head, yes. How am I gonna provide value to them? What's in it for them? This kid that came to meet with me, what was in it for me? Now I'm a coach and I love helping young people and I love solving problems and I love having people have breakthroughs. But he didn't know any of that. He could have played up to that. He probably could have got free coaching if he can swim, bike, or run. I do that normally. And, you know, I don't have to charge lots of hours if I'm working out. I only have to be able to speak through the running. Positivity. Why is that so important? Israel, did you see Gary Vee's post on positivity? He's got, he had a post in the past two months on positivity. And he said, 
If I meet someone and in the first 10 minutes they complain, they ain't for me. Yeah, well, and Gary's got a really foul mouth, if you think I have a foul mouth, but yes. Yeah, that, that's what he said, and that explains why he said that, just the words are not complaining. Yeah, he, well, he also said that someone who's going to complain to you in the first 10 minutes is probably not someone that's going to be able to get through all the hard times that your business has. So if you go into an interview and you complain, it's okay to talk about things that you've overcome, it's okay to talk about challenges, but they all have to be poised in a positive way and an optimistic rooted thing. I'm not saying you should hold back. And I, I actually posted that and I got um, hated or shamed by some woman that said, well, what if a woman was working in a job and she was you know, the subject of abuse? How would she be positive about that? I'm like, oh my, like really? Exactly what I'm talking about. Go away. That's not a person I want to be with. Not that it's not good that that's not an issue. Of course, that's an issue. But why do you come to that? I'm talking about, you know, reasonable circumstances. You be positive. No one wants to hire a negative Nancy or Nelly. Nancy is my sister. Is she? Is it? <laughs> really? Is she a negative Nancy? Yeah. yeah. OK, well, there we go. So positivity is really important. In order to great, ask great questions, you really need to listen. The power of the question, which is the last thing, questions rule. Why are questions so important? Questions are the way to lead teams. They're the way to coach. They're the way to, why are they so important? What do they demonstrate? Don't flip, what's that? That you care, yeah. What else do they demonstrate? What else can good questions demonstrate? Curiosity. Curiosity. What else? Uh, in a way, vulnerability. That you don't know everything. Uh, sure, vulnerability or an eagerness to help. You care. You want to help them. What else? If you ask really good. So the first question better be open-ended and general. Never ask yes, no questions. Even, you know, every good lawyer knows that. But you want to, and you want to ask deep questions. Because I don't ask, like, when I meet someone at a cocktail party, I'm not like, well, where do you live? I'm like, what's the most interesting thing that happened to you this week? <laughs> like, what's the coolest place you made a difference this week? Tell me about what your kids mean to you. Tell me the best experience you ever had with your kid. What did you learn from being a parent? What do you wish you would have done better as a parent? Like, those are questions. When, and you may get people that are like, are you, are you shrinking me? Matter of fact, I had that. I said a big bar mitzvah in uh, LA, of course. And I asked, um, I was asking questions like that and some head of a studio <laughs> turned to me and said, what are you, shrinking me? <laughs> and I was like, I'm just asking you deep questions. He's like, who are you anyway? He said to me. I'm like, well, I'm the bar mitzvah kid. That's my best friend's kid. You know, why are you at this table? Like this is assaulting me with my questions because I got deep. I was like, you know, what are you so worried about? Uh, where'd you go to law school again? <laughs> Mr. Southwestern Law, Georgetown. But anyway, <laughs> right? Where did, what firm did you work at? I mean, like that was his response. You get those once in a while. But most people, you'll start a relationship where you may learn or connect with one of your favorite people. And they also show you're smart and you, you want to solve problems. And that you're challenging and that you're innovative. So this whole question asking and listening to the answers and coming up with following is the best thing you can do. It's how you follow the platinum rule. You ask great questions and you listen to the answers. Uh, I have a question. Um, like the, uh, listen, be a good listener is something that you should learn or something that comes naturally when you um, uh, are really interested in it. Yeah, I think. Um, I think being a good listener, active listener, is a skill that can be acquired and it doesn't come naturally. Some people are better at it than others. Some people are just talkers. But um, yeah, no, I think it can be taught. 
and then um, develop a hive is creating a mentors or teams or attracting to the right people, you know, doing all the things that getting your peeps, getting, you know, the people you hang around with is usually what your life is like. So don't hang around with the studio executive I was talking about because he was on his third divorce. Shocker, right? <laughs> Real shocker. Um, and then being a giver. What do I mean by being a giver? Be generous. Uh, yeah, for sure, be generous. Who's read, uh, who knows who Adam Grant is? He's a Wall Street Journal reporter. Does anyone read the book Give and Take? I'm just going to tell you this quick story and then we'll wrap it up. Um, Adam Grant wrote a book and he studied venture capitalists in the Bay Area and there were three types of venture capitalists. There were givers, there were takers and there were matchers. Who were, givers are what? People that are generous and they give value. What are takers? What's that? Who's a taker? What does a taker do? They take, they're all about themselves. What's in it for me? Givers are with them, takers are with them. What's in it for me? What's a matcher? If you give me some, right, quid pro quo. I'll give you this for that. You give me something, I'll give you something back. You introduce me to two people, I'll introduce you to two people. You help me get a job, I'll help you get a job. You look at my resume, I'll look at your resume. You take me, drive me somewhere, then I gotta take you somewhere. That's a matcher. Adam Grant studied these venture capitalists that had these types of qualities. Who were the most successful venture capitalists? The givers. How many say the givers were the most successful? Okay, I love young people. You guys are right. The givers were the most successful. Who were the least successful? Givers, takers, or matchers? Matchers. Who says takers? Who says matchers? Okay, who says the right answer? <laughs> who says givers? givers? Givers were the least successful and the most successful. What's the difference in the giver that was the most successful? Depends on the perspective of the Cindy, did you just say that? Exactly. So the giver that was the most successful was the one that, as Oprah says, put their oxygen mask on first. Because if you don't know your own story, you don't know yourself, you don't take care of yourself, you don't work out, you don't have balance in your life, you haven't understood what success really means for you, you're giving it all away and so there's nothing left, there's no boundaries. You suck and everything's sucked out of you. The giver that gets it understands that I need to take care of myself, there is a limit, there are boundaries, and along with those boundaries, if I still have this outward focus on helping people and giving to them and being generous, then that's the type of giver I want to be and that's the type of leader I want to be. If you can keep these nine things along with having great shoes in check, I really think that you can kick butt. And I really think that you can provide value to the world. With that, any questions? <laughs> okay, I just want to tell you that the, the number one and two questions are, how do you remember our names? And usually when I'm speaking around the country, why, you must live in Southern California, you're very tan. So <laughs> to me, um, like out of all the things we talked about, that's what you're gonna ask me, how I remember the names and why I'm tan. It's like, come on. Um, I just remember your names because I care enough and all I do is repeat them and I've been blessed with a good memory. Yeah? Uh, do you have uh, some sort of a, uh, everyday exercises to train your brain in, a, in a, this direction? That yeah. You will try to make it? I, so I, I wear my bracelet, which is, right, you can't be bold without being generous and empowering, otherwise you're just an ass, right? <laughs> and so you really gotta understand that it's about other people. I'm framing it that. I, um, this morning I got called by something, I did my uncle a favor, and uh, we filled out this thing to speak for free, which most of the time I get paid some money to speak. And they told me, no thank you. <laughs> and I'm like, poor Jared had to do the whole thing. And so 
I'm getting the call and I'm like, oh, you, you know, I just want to hang up the phone. And so I have to reset my framework. And I said, ha, huh, how do you be your best self? What are you talking about? This is value. You're a giver. Right? I got to tell myself that stuff all the time because I just want to say, screw you. You weren't even paying me. Click. Right? But I guess, it, no, that's not what I'm about. And so um, I think there's so many different models. There are positive affirmations. There's meditation. I work out like a madman. So I spend a lot of time thinking while I'm swimming and biking and running and, and really spend some time on resetting myself and making sure my endorphins are you know, in check and I don't get depressed. Um, I feed myself regularly because I get super cranky when I haven't eaten. So I mean, I just really in tune. Um, I've asked those people around me to call me on my stuff, like my wife, which is very hard, even though 34 years, is like when, you know, that's probably not your best self. I'm like, what? You know? <laughs> but so, I mean, there's lots of tools. Um, when I get angry or I lose my control or when someone tells me no and I don't like it, I, sn I have a trick where I snap my fingers in back of me so I can reset myself. So I have all these tools. It is a lifelong journey. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about when you are afraid, afraid? I mean, uh, when you have fear to do something yeah. out of your comfort zone? Um, lean in. Double down. Double down, it's a gambling term. When I'm fearful, I go straight forward into the fear. And so I push myself to, to do it harder. When I don't want to do something, I know I need to do it. And so I push myself out of the comfort zone. Last week, there was a big uh, conference here for the Association of Training and Development. There was a party on the Midway. Last, I live in Del Mar. The last thing I want to do was drive down to the Midway, go to a, a boat that I've been on millions of times, at, eat bad food, not know one, have, not know anybody, have 2,000 people, and try and make conversation. But double down. I went, I pushed myself, I picked time. I said, you're gonna meet four people, you're gonna have four great conversations. And as soon as I was done with those four conversations, which by the way, only one of them was great, I left. <laughs> <laughs> but it's probably my fault, right? I didn't double down hard enough. Yeah, that's how I face fear. And exercise a lot as well. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, what impact are you trying to create and what are the reasonings behind it? What impact am I trying to create and what are the reasons behind it was the question. Um, I'm trying to help people help themselves in finding what impact they want to create and empowering them and giving them the tools to do it because there's nothing there's a no better feeling other than the check in the bank, which is actually this is better than getting a text that says, you've changed my life. The thing you talked about did this for me. I learned this. My, I thought about this thing when I was in the car with you. This did this. Um, you know, I just grew my practice to $4 million and it couldn't have happened without you. Um, I stayed with my wife because she gave me a different way to think about it and communicate with her. So it's, it, you know, helping people to help themselves be their best selves. What is your next big uh, challenge? My next big challenge starts next week. Anyone who wants to come can come. And it is um, a TV show. And so it's a TV show about millennials. Um, we have that. And Jared and I are working on uh, growing our speaking to the next level. I started out learning how to speak two years ago, giving it away. And now we're trying to become a world-class speaker with, like Brene Brown, we get paid a ton of money and we produce it in a really cool video, innovative, fun way that taps people and, and we scale. And then the third thing is, is we are building a um, app to teach these things and let the workplace experience and scale how to tell your story, how to understand your strengths, how to create a peer bonding with people, and how to get coaching on demand like Uber. For just, you press a button and your coach appears, and you say, Dan, I'm having a problem with running my team. Here's my whole profile in the bank. What am I missing? Or whoever answers the phone. Those are the three next big challenges. Yeah? What's the name of the TV show? It's gonna be called Very, Very, Very 
interestingly enough, LaunchBox 365. <laughs> Uh, that is the name for now. That's the working LaunchBox 365. Yeah. We'll see if we change it, but um, yeah, my partner has a bunch of other TV shows, and so he's done it for 27 years. He's big TV host and on the radio, and so we'll see if we can do it differently and have great stories. So if anyone actually wants to talk a little bit, um, video, come meet me afterwards. We'll do a couple minute shots. We'll ask you questions. And um, we'll talk about you know the biggest impact you want to have, your ideas, all those things. Um, we're looking for packages and guests. We're going to be doing four shows a week. Um, what, um, where will it air? Uh, Fox Business. Um, uh, I, I, I could send you the list. Fox Business, YouTube, Apple, Roku, um, World Armed Forces Radio, Armed Forces TV, a whole bunch of different networks. Yeah. Fox is probably the biggest, yeah. All right, guys, I just wanna, I wanna tell you this um, before I leave. First of all, any of you can sign up at any time at that link for a free coaching session with myself or one of our other seven to 10 coaches. Um, if you ever need a challenge, please reach out on LinkedIn. Um, you can stop by our offices in Sereno Valley. We're always there. We kind of have an open, rolling door, it's kind of this hip cool thing. We do workshops once a month for the public, which is where we teach our storytelling thing. It's an eight hour workshop, which is super reasonably priced. And Jared can attest to you that you will come out there, out of there with a story um, that'll get you a job. We've had tons of people that haven't gotten a job in nine months. They take our workshop one week. They have three job offers. Um, and so, because we really understand the system of storytelling. Um, but here's the thing. Um, you know, impact is about legacy. And I just want each of you to think, even if you're young, is what is the legacy you want to create for everyone you interact with on a daily basis? Even if you don't get the job, even if you don't get the speaking engagement, what is the impact you want to have on those people and what legacy do you want? If you're a boss, what do you want your team to say about you? If you're an entrepreneur, what do you want the market to say about you? I just hope that you understand that this takes a lot of work, but it's so worth it, and you get to determine what that legacy is and how you connect. And with that, I wish you the best in defining and understanding and creating that legacy for others. Thank you. <laughs>